Hi, Stuart here. Today we revisit the Node.js Person API version 2. Alright, this is the Swagger page for 1.8.1. You can see that we have just a simple person collection API. Typically you would use it by calling the person samples count method and preceding the database with some randomly generated people. A shout out to Jacob Firm who wrote the Faker library for .NET and Node, and I use it to generate the uh, sample people to have reasonable looking data, so it's a lot easier to use. And then you can fool around with uh, ad updating or searching or whatever you want to do. So we'll just show you a, a search. We're going to see if we can find Michelle by her name. And you can see it, I can set a breakpoint in the code and do the search. We'll go back to seeing the results here. And you can see that we found Michelle and so on. What powers this experience is two things. The first is that we generate the underlying OpenAPI 3 file that has the API definition in it. And as I've said in other videos, the great thing about that is, is that I can then use that to generate a client, generate a server, a structure in any programming language that's supported by the Swagger folks. And the second piece, of course, is that this library, which I'll show you in a minute, reads the OpenAPI 3 specification in JSON or YAML, and it automatically creates using uh, style sheets and layouts and things like that this really nice user interface that you can get very easily. Very few lines of code, as I'll show you. And it is a great thing to expose to your internal developers. And you can hide this from your external developers by blocking the subpath swagger. Additionally, I found it useful when I'm making web APIs. In addition to whatever methods the API needs to implement its functionality, I always try to supply an about, a health, and uh, explicitly put in a link to download the open API file. So these three things are sort of my shop standard. I always have these endpoints uh, in every single web API project, whether I write them in Python, whether I write them in Node as I have for this one, where I write them in C Sharp, or indeed any other language, I'm going to sort of obey this dictum. Likewise, I prefer a style that is REST-ish as opposed to being hardcore rest -ive. And it's also useful in addition to all the methods you generate to generate the schemas that people will end up using uh, or getting because that way inside the methods that use the schemas where you, you bound schema to things, something which is not necessarily that nodey, right? Although if you're writing your node in TypeScript using classes, uh, you'll find that that's actually really useful. But in the specification, you can see that if I supply the schema elements, that in the UI and indeed in the file itself, which I'll show you in a minute, you get the schema layout. And that is a huge help. And out of the box in Node, you wouldn't get that as easily. Again, if you do this in TypeScript and use a slightly different library, you can get a better version. I wanted to do a pure API just in Express with a, with a minimum number of libraries just to demonstrate that you can make really usable APIs really easy. So let's stop and go look at the schema file, which I'm generating as JSON. And then we'll go on to dismantle how we got these things and the methodologies around that. So here's the generated Swagger JSON file, and I'll show you the libraries and how we got here. But essentially, when we generate a, an open API 3 file, we want to seed it with all the useful metadata that we can get our hands on. I like to make sure that I seed the version, the title, the description, the contact information, the license information, I want to seed it in addition to the things that are auto-generated, like the paths. I want to make sure that I seed the schema elements as well, as I've spoken to you about a minute ago, and that 
goes into the component schemas. So we have a person schema, that's the single object, and the people schema, which is the array of people. The definition for OpenAPI 3 considers all collections to be arrays or dictionary, and they think of those as being hash tables. So, you know, you in your programming language, you can have lots of different collection types, but fundamentally, they're going to come down to some sort of a hash table or some sort of an array. And that's what we want to boil them down to because those are sort of the universal pieces of language glue that I can get at in almost every decent programming language it has a hash table and almost every decent programming language has an array. In fact, I'd say that if you were using a language that doesn't have a hash table or doesn't have an array, that, that would be very. So let's see how we generate that. So before we go there, I want to pull up the entry point to this API. So this is the file that Node would start in order to start your server. And I'm going to point out a couple of things to you, including one kind of vexing thing, and that is some of the libraries that I'm using for backward compatibility, you'll notice I'm using the require syntax instead of the more modern syntax. I'm just trying to go for the lowest common denominator that is still reasonably state-of-the-art. But some of those libraries don't necessarily like it when you have strict turned on. So you'll see that there are two modules, one the index and the other the swagger generator, where we've disabled strict, but we have used ESLint heavily to make sure that we are getting the highest quality code that we can. And I'll show you the ESLint file. It's much easier to understand if you just go out to the GitHub and take a look at it and explore it. So this is the my strongly opinionated ESLinting configuration for my projects in this version of Node without TypeScript and using the you know sort of compatible require style of module reference. A couple of things that I like to do that I have gotten from some other developers is I have tried to make sure that we have support for sig term and sig quit by wiring up process on and then the shutdown method just calls process.exit the reason that it's in its own function is so I have potentially in the future some control over that. The other thing you'll notice is is that instead of putting all this code in just literally in this file, what I've done is I've said, okay, well, I'm going to have a function called main. And a lot of that is just I program in Python and C Sharp 2, and I like a main. A main is intelligible to me. But the other thing is, is that allows my main to be asynchronous, which is, it turns out, a good thing. So let us go find our main function. Here's our main function. And you'll notice that I have it as a lambda. That's an async function. One of the advantages to that is that I can call await when I have promises. A lot of libraries expose promises or they expose something that is declared to be asynchronous. And having an asynchronous main allows me to then use those things without having to bend my arm around my elbow to get them to act like I want. So for example, when I'm generating the swagger, I have an open API 3 generator class that I wrote. We're going to dive into it because that's where the good stuff. I want my generator method to be a sync. And the reason is, is that inside the library I'm using that generates the open API 3, it has a promise mechanism. And I want the open API 3 file to generate and finish generating before I use it in any of the subsequent code. So I really want to await the generator to make sure that it's done before I try to use it. And then at that point, that open API 3 file has been generated by in part by reflecting on the routers and in part through some metadata. So that's it. Dive into that. But just happy hint from Halloween is one of the best things that you can do to make your startup code a lot happier is to declare it async. And then again, all you really have to do at the bottom of your file is call main. And Node will happily run this without complaint. One more note about the files in this, they all support JS docs. So that comment that is a 
forward leaning slash with two asterisks on a blank line is the signal to JS stock that that comment isn't a regular comment, it is a JS stock comment. And I'll point out that one of the things I found out when I added JS linting rules to my ESLint configuration is the strong preference that the narrative comment be the first line in the file and that any subsequent added attributes were following that. So that was interesting. That's something I did not know. So we're going to use a library called Swagger Autogen. And we're telling it that we want to generate OpenAPI version 3 because that is not only the state of the art, but in many ways, it is the most compatible across programming languages and things. And that will change over time, right? Uh, new specifications come out for OpenAPI 3, and they have new capabilities and so on. Hopefully, the, the good folks that made Swagger Autogen will do, you know, the updates are required to generate the newer formats. But 3.0 is a pretty good, solid format that works in, it, that I've tried, that works in, C Sharp and Python. Again, I, those are the three languages I use the most often. Key secret sauce to this in a, a habit of mine, because I want to have closure, is I tend to make most of my code exported in a module as a class. And I can have static classes like my my utility class that shows up in pretty much every single one of my examples. The other thing is to make clear the separation of duties or the single responsibility principle of the two libraries I'm going to show you. Swagger Autogen's purpose is just to generate an open API 3 file. That's it. That's all it, it knows how to do. But in doing that, it's capable of mimicking reflection that you would find in languages like C Sharp, which is to say that Swagger Autogen has a reasonably sophisticated code parser using Babel under the covers. And it is capable, therefore, of parsing the syntax tree of your code and using that to reflect on what the routes are in your Express app. And by the way, Swagger Autogen supports a number of popular libraries like Restify and things like that. Again, I'm using Express to sort of be as vanilla as possible. And I've used Express for a while and I like it. It's just a personal preference. You could argue that Restify is far better and I couldn't argue with you about that. But again, Express is kind of the universal build me an API glue that I like. You can use it to build all sorts of things. So Swagger Autogen is the object that we're going to be interacting with to tell it, I want you to reflect on my code and then go through and make an open API three object structure in memory. And then I'm going to tell it to write it to disk. And that's going to be my open API, my Swagger JSON file. And then completely separately, I'm going to feed that Swagger JSON file to the Swagger UI library, and it's going to render that experience along with all the functionality. And it doesn't care how I came by the Swagger JSON or the Swagger YAML, it just knows that if it has one, it can render a user experience. That solid separation of concerns thing is great. So let's go look at our class. It's not that complicated, actually. Although there are some subtleties, I'm going to call the generate function. I'm going to pass in an array of URLs and the port to generate the schema for. And that port information and those URLs are going to be eaten up by the UI library so that it knows when it calls the method endpoints, what's the base URL. So I have an array of URLs and a port. So the next thing is, because I'm not using TypeScript, I have some trade-offs. One of the trade-offs is that I have to build my DTOs, the things that I use as input and output parameters for my API, manually. So I create a comps object, components object, and you can see that it's a just plain old JavaScript object, and it has a components, and inside components it has schemas, and then for each schema, we can follow the definitions and put things in. So if a field starts with a dollar sign, it's required. So ID, first name and last name are required. Cell phone, company, and email are not. And then for people, I can say, well, the type, which I don't need to specify for 
a, D, a single DTO, but I do need to specify for a collection, is an array. And if I have an array, I have to supply the items. And the reference to that is that it's an array of pound sign components, schemas, person. So the first part of that, all the way up to person, will always be the same. And so that defines really the only externalized classes and class collections that I expose in my API. So I have to do this manually, but it isn't really that hard to do. In TypeScript, you can do some more work and you can actually get it to reflect on these. Interestingly, you may want to do this manually anyway, so you can exert more control over the generation. So that's the first thing. The second thing is it, we wanted to re essentially reflect. It's not really reflection. It's sort of DOM parsing, but the effect is the same. I tell it my routers, uh, where my routers are, person router and info router, and it will crawl those as part of the auto generation. So now that we have that, let's go see the actual generation. So I call await swagger autogen of the output file, the, the file I want it to make, the endpoint files and the, and the comps, the, the composite things, which are all of the models, essentially, all the DTOs. And then if that's all I wanted to do, I could just stop but. I want it to do some more stuff. So what I say is, well, I'm going to go and use a trick of require, which is that if you have something that is parsable to JavaScript, it just works. So the output file is a JSON file, as we've seen. And if you require it, what OpenAPI 3 turns out to be is a tree of JavaScript objects that that match the property tree that's in the JSON file. My favorite stupid programmer trick. And I do it again to go parse package JSON. Uh, so why am I parsing package JSON? Well, I'll tell you. If we go look in package JSON, you'll see that I've added a bunch of attributes to it, like the name, the version, the description, and lots of other good stuff like that. Author, license, all kinds of good stuff in here. And why that's cool is then what I can do is I can suck up the package JSON and I can use it to populate additional properties that I want injected into open API, the OpenAPI 3 document. And then once I've done that, I can then re-render it to disk with all my new stuff in it. And then when the when a tool takes a look at that JSON file, it's going to see all that metadata that wasn't in there before. Now, you may have noticed that this looks somewhat imperfect and that there are certain properties that you can't actually put into packages JSON, or I haven't figured out how to put them into packages JSON, so that I could get them directly from packages JSON, and then this would be a more universal thing. So you'll see I have some hard-coded things in here just out of pure laziness because I haven't been able to figure it out. Maybe in a future video, I'll show you how I solved that problem. But again, what I've done is I've, the open API three object is the JavaScript object tree of the open API three file as JavaScript. So I can do everything I can do in JavaScript. For example, I can add a contact collection and then I can populate it with stuff. Notice that I have to be very careful to make sure that my spelling and my various object tree things are valid open API 3 syntax. But there is an open API 3 syntax checker. So after I generate the JSON, or if you prefer YAML, the YAML file, I can go out to one of the websites that will validate it, feed my output file to it, and it will tell me if I have anything that is outside the specification, which is very useful, which I've done, by the way. And so this this version, uh, between those two things, switching back and forth between generating some schema and then validating the schema, that's how I fine-tuned how this all worked. And so after I have done all the manipulations and customized the the URLs, what I can then do is say, well, I, in this case, I want it to be JSON. I like JSON. I find YAML a bit clunky. So what I do, of course, is I say, all right, well, I'm going to then take my open API three object tree, which is in uh, JavaScript, and I'm going to turn it into JSON and I'm going to write it back to my output file. And because this is called with a weight, 
This whole process will execute before my service tries to start. So this is how you inline generate your documentation. So you go in and you add uh, more methods to your router or whatever. And then when your app starts, it'll rerun this and generate a new JSON file. And then when you throw the UI at it, it will absorb that JSON file and display a user interface that now matches your specification. So let's take a look inside the one of the routers just to show you that you need to do a little more work. We'll show you the person router because that's kind of the guts of this thing. And again, you see I use J, uh, JS comments a lot. And then for each one of the methods, there's sort of two pieces of secret sauce. Piece of secret sauce number one that took me forever to figure out was that your documentation, either in the Swagger web page or in JS Docs, doesn't quite generate happily unless you assign your router dot statement to a variable that can then be reflected on. In this case, it's a constant because it doesn't change after it's defined. And the second thing is, is that in comments, and it doesn't matter, you can see I have two examples of both of the comment styles here, that I can then populate the Swagger metadata with additional stuff. So for person list, I say the summary is gets all people, and then I can give it the list of responses, for example. And then down below, for I have... Uh, another example of, you know, the contract and the comments for creating a list of people. And I have here a slightly more complicated example for search where I say, well, the summary is this and then it will respond to 200. And if it does, does it's going to return the array of, of person, which is people. And if it doesn't find it, it's going to return a 404. And if you supplied blank text to it, it's going to bark at you with a 400. So you can really add a lot of depth of annotation by using these comments that the DOM parser or the reflector, if you will, in the generator picks up and adds to your schemas automatically. Notice these comments have to be in the scope of the method for the router. So we say router and we say what, you know, get, put, post, patch, whatever. And we say what the path is. And we then supply a Lambda request fonts. And in there, we can do our business logic, which is 139 to 145, essentially. But inside of that scope, you can put your Swire comments. And I tried putting these outside, and it just never sees them. So there's a little helpful hint from Stuart that uh, this is one of the things that vexed the daylights out of me. And by the way, it doesn't seem to care whether or not you have one comment block or 20 comment blocks or whatever inside. It just goes and looks for everything that starts with pound sign swagger dot and tries to do the right thing. And if it doesn't like it, it spits out an error and tells you pretty good errors about why it doesn't like it. So that's the generator part. We've got to do a, l a little extra work when we're in pure JavaScript, we have to add annotations to our routers. We have to explicitly list the routers we want it to scan. We have to supply the DTOs and other contracts. We need to put comments in about the kinds of responses that it has. We may want to embellish it with a summary and some other things that make the UI look nice. And then if we want to if we want to add additional metadata to our open API description, we need to then hijack the output of the auto generation process and go through and add the things that we want and then write it back to disk. And we want to do all of that before it starts. And I'll show you that again and then I'll show you how the UI works. So here is our Swagger generator in situ. Notice it's ho hoisted fairly high in the file to make sure that it gets done before we start doing anything else. It happens before we even start setting up Express because again, we want this file to be in made and effectively static before we start using Express. And so the other, other thing that we do in our preamble section is we just set up an access log stream object, which is a conversation for a different video. And then Let's go and find out where our JSON file actually gets used. So 
Again, stupid programmer trick. We require the JSON file and that materializes Swagger file as a JavaScript object tree. We can then set the options that we want our UI to have and then we just use our app use, right, which inserts a piece of middleware and we say that middleware is going to respond on slash swagger. The function that it's going to do is it's going to call the serve function on swagger UI and the preamble for that is it's going to call swagger UI setup using swagger file and options as the argument. And then at that point, the swagger endpoint will serve up that piece of dynamic HTML that is the Swagger endpoint. And I urge you to go and look at the options available for this tool. You'll notice that I put uh, comments in that show you where to go and take a look at stuff and where the documentation is. And this is just the coolest thing since buttered bread if you're programming in, in for Node.js because now you can get the same rich generation of a Swagger JSON file, you know, an open API 3 spec. Again, you can get it in YAML or you can get it in JSON. And it has the virtue of then also having to much more enriched UI out of the box than you would get if you just called app use and you didn't give it any options or you didn't give it a Swagger file that had been significantly enriched. That's a thing that's worth doing. My name is Stuart. Thank you for your kind attention.